Hello Overclockers, I'm 8Pack, Head of R&D here at OC UK. We've been putting the latest 12th gen Intel processors through the paces for a good few months and I'm here to give you a brief overview of the new CPU, the new platform and the new technologies that it brings. Obviously, 8-pack uh, is literally the flagship range here at Overclocker, so I've only been looking at the i9-12900K and what that can bring to the table for you in your games and creative content. This CPU is a 10 nanometer part with a very exclusive, if you like, hybrid technology. On this part, you've got what's called performance cores, all which have hyperthreading built in, and you've got efficiency cores, and the design it on the i9 part is eight performance cores, like I said, all with hyperthreading, and eight efficiency cores, none of which have hyperthreading. And the idea of the CPU is that the performance cores do the majority, or in fact, all the heavy lifting, while the efficiency cores do all the light stuff in the background. So for example, you're running a game, the game's mechanics and all the information, if you like, that's going to the GPU is running on the performance cores, whilst all the operating system and other background tasks are running on the efficiency cores. And of course, providing that Windows task schedule is set up correctly, then this can be a very efficient architecture for ensuring performance while keeping temperatures down and improving overall efficiency of the system. The new i9-12900K brings with it some new technology. So let's quickly just discuss them. So within the CPU itself, you've got a integrated IMC, which allows for both DDR4 and the new DDR5 uh, technology to be used uh, with the specific CPU. Alongside that, you've got a new socket with 1700 pins uh, as opposed to 1200, which came on the old mainstream socket. And obviously these extra pins are in the main use for power, the new hybrid design and signaling to the new memory structure and the new PCI Express architecture. This PCI Express architecture is now up to PCI Express Gen 5 from what previously was Generation 4. Obviously, given the changes to the socket LJ1700, the actual socket itself is now larger and the pins where you mount the CPU cooler are also at a larger dimension. So if you've got an AIO or an air cooler or even a water block, you will need a new mounting mechanism to get the best out of it. So with the new CPU, we've discussed you need uh, 1700 pins in the socket, and that means you have to plug these into the new platform, which is Z690. Uh, on Z690, I've tested a lot of motherboards from all the different vendors, but my favorite ones, I have to say, on uh, DDR4, uh, the Strix A Gaming, which I have here. Uh, and then on DDR5, I like the Gigabyte Aorus Master. Uh, I like the Strix I, which is a nice little uh, ITX board, which is offering a lot of new features. I also like the Formula, the Hero, uh, and of course the Apex, which is a two dim DDR5 board, which is designed to absolutely max out the overclocking uh, on LN2. And I still do a bit of that extreme overclocking, which I think we'll show in a later video. So basically, when you're deciding on your platform for the new CPU, you have to decide whether you wanna go on the old DDR4 standard or on the new DDR5 standard. The older DDR4 standard means usually that the motherboards are gonna be at a cheaper price point because DDR4 doesn't require the PCB density or the signaling of DDR5. And of course, as usual, when new things come out, that you have to pay a premium for the DDR5 uh, standard to be met. So let's now talk about a little bit about the Strix A, which I liked for the following reasons. Basically because it ran well on all DDR4 I tried on it, which was all the way up to like 128 gig, like 3600 sticks, uh, no problem. I also tried obviously uh, 32 gig, which I've got plugged in here of the eight pack stuff, C16, again 3600. And I even tried up to eight pack, uh, 4500 uh, memory sticks. But what I found was, just like uh, on previous platforms, as soon as you get the IMC running on a divider, which for DDR4 was anything above 3600, then you actually lost performance. So there was no point to buy memory sticks faster than 3600 and you want to keep timings as low as possible. So that's what I found on DDR4. And I like this as well, because even with the amount of phases and power delivery here, I was really able to max out the CPUs or get pretty much uh, 
almost as good a frequency as I could on the crazy high-end DDR5 boards. Certainly something that someone, if someone was in the market for a, for a, a mid-end board, they, they wouldn't be bothered about that extra performance, I wouldn't suggest. So moving on to DDR5 compatible motherboards, which are probably what you would say would be the mid-price bracket here in Z690. I've really got two favorites, which is the Asus ROG Hero motherboard, or, or the Aorus Master that we have here. Both of them have got really uh, nice heat sinks. They, they take the black, should I say, lack of color design, which I like. Uh, as you'll have seen from previous videos on here, I don't really like a lot of color on, on my uh, main boards at this level. Uh, and they do offer some good tuning options on your DDR5. Obviously, PCI Express Gen 5 for any uh, Gen 5 devices that you, you want to plug in there that will come out in the future. And then they're able on this standard board to really max out the CPU uh, overclocking, the IMC overclocking, uh, and the memory overclocking as far as the individual sticks will go for sure. So that those are the boards that I like uh, in the mid-price range. Of course, I've all already given a uh, uh, honorable mention to the Apex because that's the absolute best board that you can buy for extreme overclocking. But of course, it's only limited to two dims, not the four dims that you've got on typically the Aorus uh, Master here or the Hero. So it offers no real upgradability in the memory capacity department if you want to add more than two sticks. And you're only limited on those boards currently to like a maximum of 64 gig. At time of cutting this video, the, the memory sticks are only 16 gig maximum capacity at the minute for DDR5. So on the Apex, you could only get a maximum of 32 gig, which is too small for a lot of users. And certainly Apex systems, it's too, probably a bit too small for that going forward these days. My favorite board so far on uh, Z690, it's definitely this formula board because I really love the white design and I'm gonna make a white version of the Hypercube to really take into account this white design. Obviously, we've got the integrated water block here, which is made by EK to uh, cool the VRM section, which on these boards I found in general, they're not getting uh, hot at all, but obviously this will improve the efficiency and the power delivery. You've got all the overclocking on the DDR5 memory. You've got the overclocking of the CPU slightly better again than what the other boards can do. If not, what I would call significantly better still is better. And then you've got DDR5 NVMe support, obviously PCI Express support for when those devices come out. So this is my uh, all time favorite so far. Let's move on to performance, benchmarking and overclocking. So my formula for testing this CPU was to just initially just plug in the CPU, uh, mount the cooler, which for all this testing I used a 360mm Acetec cooler uh, with EK fans spinning at up to 2200 RPM. Uh, so the methodology was plug in the CPU, mount that particular cooler, plug in the, in the memory, be it DDR4, DDR5, just set XMP on the memory and then run the tests initially. Because what I wanted to see was under stock performance, how high the CPU would boost, and if indeed the temperature of the CPU was affecting the boost speed. And what I found out was obviously that the lower the temperatures and the lower the loads, the higher the clock frequency could boost to. Now, if you used Asus's turbo boost algorithm in there and you put plus two on that, uh, in the BIOS, you would get like a boost of around 5,400 megahertz. At complete stock, it was boosting to like 5,200 or 5,300 as a maximum. And then of course, I ran through a suite of benchmarks, including some games, 3D Mark, uh, Heaven, uh, Valley, and then uh, some multi-core stuff like Geekbench, uh, Cinebench R20 and Cinebench R23. And then after doing that uh, for a while, for all, not on all the boards I was testing, I also tested uh, with the CPU on a manual overclock. And on the manual overclock, I put the performance cores to either 5 gigahertz or 5.1 gigahertz. And I put the efficiency cores to either 3.9 or 4 gigahertz, depending on the motherboard and depending on how high it was possible to push that particular CPU on those boards. What I found was actually, even in gaming where the clocks were, were going above 5.1 gigahertz, that the, the performance was better with a static overclock. Uh, and I believe that's because the, the frequency tended to cycle between different cores that were being maxed out. And obviously the game was not always on the highest frequency core. Whereas if you've got all the cores at a static overclock of say 5.1, then it's always on the highest frequency core because they're all at that specific speed. I also found that for multi-threading, uh, that if you push the efficiency cores up as well as the performance cores, you get a really nice boost. 
uh, from the stock of the efficiency cores and that all efficiency cores could overclock no problem to 3.9 or 4 gigahertz with no increase in voltage needed above what you'd already set for the performance core. So the L2 voltage effectively, uh, just leaving that at auto. I mean, if, you, if we have to compare this against previous generations, what I found was if you're running in, say, 1080p and a game that's bottlenecked by CPU, you could see like 10% or, or so improvement, even more sometimes uh, in that type of game. But obviously, if you're running in on 4K resolution, a very modern AAA title, which is bottlenecked with the GPU, you see a lot lower uh, single-figure improvement overall. On multi-core, uh, this really did uh, smash and what you what you saw was really eight performance cores, so 16 performance threads and eight efficiency threads, so a total of 24 threads uh, is almost as fast as 32 59 50x AMD threads uh, running in multi-thread, but not quite as fast. So say in Cinebench R23, you would get like uh, 28 or 29,000 points on an Intel 12th gen, whereas on a 5950X with the 32 threads, you would get around 30,000, just above 30,000 uh, points on that. So pretty close. Uh, and what that does show you is that the 12th gen is very, very efficient for the amount of cores and threads available to it. Obviously, I tested uh, this stuff as well. I tried Windows 10 and I tried Windows 11. Windows 11, I did see some boost, but not the boost that's been touted uh, by this Windows scheduler improvement. I personally, in my testing, didn't see that. Not to say it doesn't happen, but I just didn't seem to come across a program that I ran that, that was really helped by Windows 11. I also saw uh, some similar results, if you like, when we're comparing DDR4 to DDR5. Now for me, the sweet spot so far was actually the DDR4 motherboard with the DDR4 3600 running at C16 compared to uh, the DDR5 motherboard uh, with DDR5 running at anything up to 5200 memory, which I had here, and I even overclocked that to 5600. Uh, and saw maybe only, only one or two percent uh, improvement from switching to DDR5, uh, which of course with the pricing of DDR5 as it is now up to double the price of equivalent DDR4, uh, that's, that in my eyes is not enough performance improvement to justify that outlay. Of course for 8-pack systems, do I, do I care about one or two percent? Yes I do. Will I be using DDR5 in 8-pack system? Yes I will. But I'll also be offering uh, a DDR4, if you like, bundle with the Strix A that I showed earlier with 3600 C16, which really is the sweet spot because the, the frequency of the IMC uh, at that uh, particular memory speed is running a one-to-one -one divider with the memory speed. As soon as you go above that, even with DDR4, it's running a divider which knocks IMC speed down by half which affects the, the latency. Even all the way up to DDR5 5600, you don't gain back that extra latency of the IMC and therefore the performance is, is only one or two percent extra for that massive hike in frequency. So in summary, if you're thinking of investing in Intel 12th gen, currently my recommendation would be to go with DDR4 above DDR5 until the technology develops and you can get more frequency and therefore it makes a higher benefit than the one or two percent. But, but my current recommendation would have to be go with DDR4, go with something like the uh, Asus Strix A motherboard or a similarly good motherboard, which can also max out the static overclocking, which I found to be better than the boost. But for someone who was not confident with static overclocking, the boost is obviously uh, still a fine level of performance. Do pay attention to your cooling. And I do recommend a minimum of an AI water cooler so that you do get the either the maximum possible overclocking out of the CPU and I would advise that when you're really mounting the cooling plate on the new CPU that you really pay attention to how you screw it down uh, because that tension uh, on the IHS does definitely make a difference and the pressure does really need to be even across the larger socket. So if you're not confident in overclocking and tuning the 12th gen yourself keep an eye out on Overclockers UK for my 12th gen bundles, which will include bin CPUs and other binned hardware with the CPU performance cores all the way up to 5.2 gigahertz available and efficiency cores all the way up to 4 gigahertz available to get the absolute best performance. Obviously also keep an eye out for the 12th gen in my eight pack systems. So that's basically been the ultimate babble guide to the 12th gen by me, king of all systems eight pack.